All right, everybody, uh, we are going to get started. Uh, thank you all very, very much for joining our webinar on SEO. Uh, Ring Partner is absolutely thrilled that we could have uh, one of our one of our experts, one of the global experts in SEO, Ben Holland from Zion and Zion. Uh, ben obviously has many, many years experience in the SEO field. Uh, very proud to bring us a presentation and uh, we're gonna pass it along to him in just a couple seconds here. And just a quick note, uh, if you have any questions, we're going to leave those until the very end of the presentation. Should be about uh, 25 minutes to half an hour. And uh, yeah, if you have any questions, just please type it in the questions panel. And of course, we will be recording this webinar. So if you miss part of it, or for those that aren't here, if you're not here, you can watch it uh, later and you'll be able to find out all information about Ring Partner and Zion and Zion on our social media feeds, of course. And with that, I'm going to pass it over to, uh, to Ben to start the presentation. Ben, can you hear me okay? I can, and thank you for the kind introduction. Um, first and foremost, I'd like to thank everybody at Ring Partner for giving me this opportunity, and everybody in attendance for taking time out of their day uh, to listen to what I have to say about SEO. Um, today, I'm going to talk about what is SEO. So I'm going to talk about the basics of SEO, if it's new to you, um, and then some things you can look for when you're hiring a company, uh, when you're making a new website, and just some tips and tricks I've learned throughout my years as an SEO. Um, just to make you better and more aware of what's going on. Because we all know that there's lots of different SEO companies and consultants out there, and a lot of them promise you the world and then they don't deliver. And um, sometimes SEO can even get you in a lot of trouble with Google and other search engines if it's done incorrectly. So at the end of this presentation, I hope you guys are armed with everything you need to know uh, to talk uh, smartly about SEO to anybody that you need to and be able to hire somebody or do it yourself. All right, first, a little bit about me. Uh, my name is Ben Holland. I currently live in Phoenix, Arizona, where it's probably a lot warmer than where most of you are. Um, I'm the Associate Director of SEO for a company called Zion & Zion. We're a full-service advertising agency in Tempe, Arizona, right next to the great school, Arizona State University. Uh, we do everything from traditional, like PR, to billboards, to TV ads, to uh, digital. Uh, where we do PPC display advertising, SEO, web design, graphic design, and social media. So if you can think of us and you have a marketing need, we can help you out with that. I encourage all of you to check out our website, zionandzion.com. We have a very active blog. It's updated weekly with very high-level uh, information from all of our employees. All of our employees are subject matter experts in what they do, and uh, they write four blog posts a year for us. So no matter what you're looking for for marketing, uh, we have a great resource for you. I'm also a uh, founder and owner of a company called Scorpion Sweepers. It's a pest control company out here in Phoenix. We have a big scorpion problem. They sting a whole lot of people, so I go out on my Friday nights and I catch them for people. So uh, while creating this company, I've honed my SEO skills on my website to rank number one for a variety of terms, uh, up against a lot of big dogs like Terminex and Ortho and even larger companies we have here. So I practice what I preach and I've tested it, and I hope that uh, you can take what I've learned and apply it to your businesses. So the first thing I want to do is just talk about what SEO is. It stands for um, Search Engine Optimization. Now, Search Engine Optimization may mean different things to many people, uh, but this is the Wikipedia definition. It's the process of affecting the visibility of a website or a web page in search engines uh, for unpaid results, also known as organic, natural, or earned. Um, the way I like to put it is uh, it's what you can do to your website to help you rank better on Google. That's really what most people care about. Uh, with the clients that I deal with, about 75 to 95% of their organic traffic is from Google. So that's what I'm going to talk to. If you have a big need for Bing or DuckDuckGo, uh, AltaVista even, or if you're foreign, there's other um, search engines that you're interested in. A lot of this stuff will apply, but I'm going to frame this conversation based on Google because uh, it's what a majority of people need to worry about, and everybody else is just copying what Google does in all honesty. Um, so you may think, what's the value of SEO? Why, why would I want to invest my time and money into SEO, and what can it do for my business? Uh, first and foremost, it can bring you more customers. Here I have a chart. This is uh, the organic traffic for Zion and Zion. Uh, this is over uh, since the inception of our, our website about three revisions ago. So since 2007, to today, uh, you can see this graph has slowly increased and uh, shows almost a hockey stick curve here in the final year. 
uh, with a lot of annotations because we've been doing quite a bit of link building. We've been doing a lot of other SEO things to our website to see improvements. And as you can see, uh, we're getting a large increase in organic traffic here. Now, organic traffic um, is what my people might call visitors. Um, they're visitors to your website that people have searched for. Uh, and this is akin to somebody walking into your front door uh, of your brick and mortar business. These are people entering your shop, your business, your website that may be interested in your service. So investing in SEO and time, you can see that in a matter uh, since 2013, we've nearly doubled the amount of people coming to our, our website monthly, which means you get more customers, more potential customers, more leads to your website. With uh, a single investment of SEO in the beginning, you can set it and forget it, and it should increase your traffic like this has. Um, all of the charts that we have for our clients kind of look like this. It does take time, though, and that's something that I, I really want to harp on here. You've got to be patient with SEO. It's not like a PPC, a pay-per-click advertising with Google AdWords. Uh, it's not going to have uh, it's not going to have results immediately. It's a six to twelve month process to do SEO, and you got to be really patient with it. Make sure whoever is campaigning this knows that it's going to take a long time to see results. And that first annotation, uh, just after 2013, is when I began here at Zion and Zion, and it took about a year before we really started seeing results. But in this past year, it's really skyrocketed, and that's the kind of thing you can see if you have a good SEO strategy and somebody really smart implementing it. The second thing is it's free. Um, unlike pay-per-click advertising, display advertising, billboards, or even commercials for your favorite attorney, uh, you don't have to pay for this. Uh, SEO, you can pay a firm like ours or other SEO firms uh, to do the SEO for you, or you can do it yourself. Now, there's forms of SEO like content marketing that I think everybody should invest in. I mean, that's as simple as sitting down for five or six hours and writing a blog post about your favorite topic to a really, really high level. Um, you want it to be better than the stuff that's out there. The whole point about SEO is doing better than the competition. And that's what this is. And this is what you need to frame your SEO strategy for. It is a competition. You are competing with other websites to get that top spot in the search engine results page, also called the SERP. Um, and it's a battle. And you've got to be better than everybody else. So if you're not making content that's better than everybody else's, you might as well not make the content. You have to be better. But when you do do that, you invest the time initially up front you don't have to keep paying for it. You don't have to do commercial runs. You don't have to pay every time somebody clicks on your website. It's going to be at the top of the search results, and it's going to look there until somebody has made a page better than yours. And you can consistently update your page. There's no shame in going in there and adding a paragraph here or there. Or if you learn something new, you can add something. And just keeping reinforcing this content on your website is going to help it rank better, and it's going to be free clicks and free visitors to your site. Now I want to talk about how search engines work, because a lot of people don't really understand Google, Bing, DuckDuckGo, and how they work on the back end. So what search engines do is they crawl through the web. They have these things called bots or spiders, and they go through uh, the internet from site to site, and they get to another site through linking. So uh, you may see in a blog post that somebody's linking to Wikipedia for a definition, or you may see they're linking to another resource or something they may have read. And Google sees that, and they go from your page to the other page, and then they crawl all that page, and they go to the links throughout. And it's kind of a spider web, and that's why they call it the World Wide Web, because it's really a web of sites that are linking to each other. And Google and other search engines send uh, scripts out there called bots or spiders to find all these pages. And once they crawl the sites, they identify the content, the subject, and the niche that they're in, and they index it in their gigantic database, which is what we're querying whenever we do a search. Uh, and then they provide the best result, results possible. Now, to do this, Google and other search engines have an algorithm. Now, this algorithm is top secret. Um, nobody really knows about it. So SEOs try to do our best to reverse engineer it and figure out what the ranking signals are. Um, and this is a slide I'd like everybody to pause, take their phones out, take a picture of, and then tweet it out. You can tweet it at me. My Twitter handle is Ben M. F. Holland. Um, using the hashtag ZZSEO, um, and it's just a little background about what the Google algorithm is. Now, there's over 200 ranking factors. So that means when Google comes to a website, they're looking at over 200 things on your website, both externally and internally, to decide whether you should rank first or 31st for that specific query or term that they're having uh, that has been queried by a user. And on top of that 200 ranking factors, there's over 500 updates a year to this algorithm. That's more than an update a day. So you can see how difficult it can be to stay up to date with what's changing with Google 
and changing with the algorithm and how to really master what's going on with SEO. For me and for my staff here, we constantly are reading SEO blogs. I'm a big uh, fan of Moz. I'm also a fan of Search Engine Journal and Search Engine Watch. Those are great resources that you can look into if you want to learn more about SEO and stay up to date with the biggest changes. Because Google does these things, they're called updates. Um, they have these big updates that, uh, like the panda, the penguin, and the pigeon, uh, the hummingbird, and the pigeon updates. Now, these are all updates you may have heard or you may not have heard of, but they are gigantic changes to the Google algorithm. So I'm going to pause here and talk about each of these updates because they can pertain to your sites whether you know it or not. So the Panda update, also known as the Farmer update, is the oldest update. It happened probably three or four years ago. And it was targeting sites that have thin or duplicate content. And what that means is thin content is a page that's only got you know, 200, 300 words on it, not too many pictures, not a lot of multimedia like uh, an infographic or a video. It's just really a, a short text. Because what people used to do, and to trick the search engines, is they would create 500 pages on their website, and they would have all of these pages with a specific question, like how to tie my shoe. And then they would have 200 words on how to tie my shoe, and that used to work. But Google didn't think that this was the best results possible for that query, so they created an update called the Panda Update that targets these sites and demotes their value. Another issue that people have been doing is uh, taking other people's content and putting it on their website and using it to rank well. Uh, that used to be a really good strategy. It's called scraping and placing. But now with the Panda update, they target this duplicate content and lower the rankings of sites that do do that. Now with this Panda update and the Penguin update, there were these things called manual actions that could be taken, where Google would look at your site manually, have somebody actually at their office review it, and then they could give you a manual penalty. Now this penalty is going to either hinder a specific page or your entire website from ranking well, or it could de-index you completely. Now de-indexing is probably the worst thing that could happen to a business that's on the web because nobody in Google, searching Google would be able to find your website because Google has taken it out of their index so it could no longer show up for a search query. And that's bad news. Um, so the Panda update and the Penguin update, which I'll get into in a minute, are things that you really want to be cautious about and that the SEO agency or person that you hire knows about and is going to do methods that prevent you from be, being hit by these penalties. Now the Penguin penalty targeted sites with bad link profiles and link farm. So a big strategy three or four years ago was, you know, to go get 500 Russian links to your website and then you would see your rankings jump up to the top and you would be there and you'd be really well and the more links you got, the better you rank. But Google figured this out and they said, well, these, ranks, these links you're just paying for and if you're paying for links, it's not an editorial decision and we're not going to let it count for, uh, as a ranking factor for your site. So they remove these uh, sites from your profile, and you may see sites drop dramatically from search engines. This was a big case with JCPenney a few years ago during Christmas. They bought a whole bunch of links uh, to promote their Christmas products, and then Google uh, de-indexed them for a couple of hours and then lowered their rankings because they practiced this. And this is something you really, really want to be cautious about, because one of the major strategies for SEO is link building, and one done properly, it can have great results. But when done improperly, it can be a detriment to your business. So that's something you want to pay close attention to. Now the Hummingbird update, uh, it kind of seemed a little bit innocuous, uh, but it really was the biggest change that Google has done in many, many years. The Hummingbird is basically taking out the current engine in Google search engine and putting in a brand new one. And this one uh, focused on semantic search and displaying results based on intent. And a good example for this is before the Hummingbird update, if I was going to look for red shoes, I would get listings of red shoes. But after the Hummingbird update, I would get listings for red shoes and red sneakers, red heels. It's taking the intent of your search, what the person is actually looking for, not just the words, and giving you the results. So this uh, ended up in less parity in results. So terms that you would search for like shoes and sneakers are going to come up with the same results more and more instead of separate results. And there's a lot more to do with this with voice search because people are doing more and more talking into their phones for search. And it, its main goal is to handle voice searches better. But that intent is what really revolutionized uh, the Hummingbird update and the Google algorithm and the changes you've seen today. Uh, the Pigeon update is a local update. And this affected uh, Google Maps. And basically, Google Maps is a different entity. And they take different ranking factors into how to rank well on the Maps result page as opposed to the organic search results. But this Pigeon update made it a lot more closer 
uh, it opened up the maps to have the same types of ranking factors as the organic. So you'll see a lot more similar results. If somebody's ranking well in organic, they'll probably rank better in maps than they had used to. Um, so user experience. This is really Google's goal. And any search engine's goal, in all honesty, is to provide the best answer to the query uh, while providing the best user experience possible. So you can see the user experience on Google is it's a box, you type in your query, and you hit enter. It's so simple and easy to use that a three-year-old can do it. And when you click on the result on Google, they want you to have the exact same experience. They want you to get to that website that they selected to be in the top spot and answer, not only answer your query, but provide a good experience. Uh, a great example of this is with the mobile algorithm change or mobile get-in that happened a few, back in April, where um, if your site wasn't mobile friendly, it would lower your rankings on mobile results. And Google did this because if you go to a site that's not mobile friendly on a mobile result, you're not going to have a good experience. You're not going to be able to click the links. You might not be able to read the text. Or you may not even be able to access the website as a whole. And this bad experience causes users to come back to Google and click another result. Well, they don't want people to do that. They want people to stay on the first result that they click um, because they want that site to provide the best experience. So Google's goal and any SEO's goal should be to provide the best experience for your user on your website. That's rule one from an SEO standpoint, having a great user experience. Now I want to get into the ranking factors. Now we saw earlier on that slide I asked you to tweet out that there's over 200 ranking factors in the Google algorithm. And that's very similar for all search engines. And there's two different types of ranking factors. So there's on-site ranking factors and off-site ranking factors. So on-site ranking factors or on-page ranking factors are pieces of code on your site that when optimized properly can help improve the visibility in search. So what that means is if I tinker with this here, it should help me rank a little bit higher. Um, a lot of these on-site factors are known as HTML. So that's hypertext markup language. And that's the code that websites are built on. It's the code that the search engines see when they crawl your website. And some of the factors uh, on your website in this HTML are your URL, your meta title, meta description, your meta keywords, the headings to your site, your, each page, linking both internally and externally, uh, the media types, so photos, videos, and alt attributes on the media. So I'm going to go into each of these individually. Um, your URL, so that's, uh, it's also known as your URI. It's uh, your um, universal resource locator is what URL stands for. So uh, that's basically the www.zionandzion.com. Oh, this is a good point. All of these slides are going to be available at the link on the bottom, zionandzion.com slash what is SEO. So if you want to refer back to this or if you want more information, that's an entire blog post I've written um, that covers this topic. So if you feel lost or want more information, please visit that, and you'll find out everything you, you need to know. And that's a perfect example of what a URL is. You'll see the tail string there, or the file name is what is SEO. The URL should mimic the title of the, the piece that you've written. So if you're an advertising agency and you do SEO services, it would be slash SEO services. Or if you're an air condition, uh, HVAC company, um, it would be air conditioning. If you're a plumber, it would be plumber services. Things like that. You want to keep it consistent because what is in the URL is a ranking factor. And if you can put the terms that you hope people are searching for to find your page in there, you're going to be more visible. And the same goes for the title. So the URL and the title should be pretty similar, if not the exact same. And it's going to focus on the canonical term of the page. Now, the canonical term is something most of you may not have heard of. But each page on your website should have a target a specific term or group of terms. And this is called a canonical term. So in our example, what is SEO? That blog post is targeting what is SEO. That's the canonical term. That is the title of our page. That is in the URL. And we also reference it in the meta description. Now, meta description and meta keywords are things that the user don't, does not see, along with the title, but they appear in the search engine's results page. Now, the title is going to be the blue link that people can click on Google. And then the meta, meta description is going to be the black or gray text that appears below the link that describes what the page is. 
Now, meta description is not a ranking factor. They don't crawl it and use it to help rank or index a website, but it's very important for clicking. So somebody may click on your page if you have a better meta description than somebody else. And something that Google is doing now as a ranking factor are what's called long clicks and short clicks. Long clicks are a click where somebody clicks on your result and stays on your page for some time without returning to Google. A short click is when somebody clicks on your result, goes to your page, and then comes back to the search engine page and clicks another result. If your site gets a lot of short clicks, it's not going to rank as well. If you get a lot of long clicks, it will rank well, and the meta description can help you get those long clicks. So while it may not be an exact ranking factor, it does have a secondary part in it. Meta keywords um, is something that is deprecated and no longer used, and I would not recommend putting meta keywords on any page on any website. Um, people used to spam meta keywords, putting hundreds if not thousands in there, and it used to be one of the more important ranking factors uh, for Google and all search engines. But they've gone away from that because people spammed it, they gamed the system. And that's something that you'll see is constant throughout um, this talk and with Google moving forward is they're in a constant battle with people like me uh, that are trying to game the search engines, go one up on them and do whatever it takes to rank well. And they can bat that with these updates and then deprecating things like meta keywords from their algorithm. Headings. So headings are like your H1, your H2. It's basically the formatted text that describes a specific section. These are probably going to be under 100 characters, and you want to focus them on the canonical term or the term that you want that section to rank for. Now, this is uh, um, something I want to talk about a little bit here. It's how you can optimize your blog post or specific page for multiple terms. Clearly, the most important term is going to be what you're focused on with the URL and the meta title, but these headings is where you can look for smaller terms. Like, for example, in my What is SEO blog post, I have a section about headings. So if somebody were to Google how to optimize my headings for SEO, hopefully I would show up for that. And that specific section of my blog post is targeted for those canonical terms. So that particular heading is going to match the terms that I hope people are searching for. So not only do you want the title of your blog post to rank well, but you want your headings to rank well as, uh, as well. So that's something you want to take your time, focus on, and do some research using Google Trends um, and the Google Keyword Planner to see what will rank well, what gets a lot of traffic, so you can make really good headings, because those are important. Now linking. Now I'm not talking about link building, I'm talking about linking from your site um, to other sites and internally. I'm a big proponent of linking. I'm a big fan of linking to external sites and internal sites. Um, linking to an external site doesn't really have any benefit from the algorithm standpoint, but my point of view is if uh, you're talking about something and, and uh, it's a topic, let's say I have a blog post and I'm talking about a canonical term. A lot of people may not know what that is, so instead of having people copy, pasting it into Google and searching it for themselves, I'll link to Wikipedia. That way people aren't leaving my page and searching for it. I'm controlling where they go and I'm having them open it in a new window so they will stay on my blog post and they can refer to that later. It's just a lot better of a user experience. So if there's ever anything on your blog post or a page that you think somebody may want to find out more about, I'd encourage you to link to Wikipedia or another resource as opposed to having them do it themselves. Internal linking is very important, especially if you're doing content marketing. Um, what happens is when somebody links to your site, uh, like in a link building program, it passes page rank to that specific page. Now you don't want all of that page rank to stop there, you want to flow throughout your website. So linking internally uh, is a great way to pass that page, uh, page rank. So a great example would be on the What is SEO page, I'm going to talk about SEO. I'm probably going to link to our SEO services page. So if somebody does link to our blog post as a reference or they think it's a really good resource, not only will that post will get credit, but so will um, our services page. It'll get a little bit of credit. Um, media types. Media types are really, really important. Uh, things like photos, videos, uh, infographics, just different type of media to break up the text. Uh, people like it. It looks good. Some people are visual learners. They're auditory learners or they like to read. So if you can put all types of formats on there, people are going to be able to learn at their preferred manner. Uh, I like to put at least a picture 
if not a video, for each section of my blog posts. So each heading you would have is a section, and each of those sections you're going to have content in the form of text and a media type, either a photo or video. I'm a big proponent of it, and with those media types, you want to have alt attributes. So alt attributes are something that the user doesn't see, but the search engines do, where uh, you say that this photo is uh, a picture of a pumpkin with a baby sitting in it. And the all attribute, um, you want to describe what's in the picture. So the all attribute was made for people who are blind or using screen readers. So when they get to an image on a website, uh, they'll be able to understand what the image is of because they can't see it. Uh, but Google uses it because they can't see images, so they use it to figure out what the image is. And on top of that, you want the file name for your images uh, to describe what the photo is as well. They can even be the exact same as the alt attribute. You just don't want it to be something like IMG0075 because that doesn't describe it and that's not optimized properly. So something that's relatively new, um, probably three or four years old now, is called schema microdata. Now schema microdata is uh, an organization, uh, schema.org is an organization that Google and Microsoft got together um, so they could help web designers and web developers parse up the content on their website so it's easier for search engines to crawl and understand. And the benefit of uh, schema microdata is that you can take up a larger presence in the search engine results page um, and you can have cool features. Here I have an example of how Best Buy has done this. Uh, you can see they have the rating stars, they have the review number, they have the price, and they have the fact that it's out of stock, and they even have the date there. Um, all of this is done through schema, schema markup, and you can see below it, that's the code for this section of their website that allows Google to understand what they're looking for and implement this in the results page. So I think schema microdata is the wave of the future. Uh, we've implemented it by default on all of the websites we create here. And if you're talking to an SEO that doesn't bring this up, you need to find a different SEO because this is, this is where the industry is going. Uh, this is extremely important and it, it really helps your visibility not only to Google and search engines, but in the search engine results page. Like if you schema up your address, you can ha then have um, a map show up next to your location with a little pin underneath it. So people click on your address and it just takes them to the map and then they can get directions immediately. Uh, it's basically how you play friendly with the search engines, and the more you do it, the more they're going to like you and the higher they're going to rank you. Some schema must-haves that I think should be on any website are schema around your phone number. Something else about your phone number is always make it click to call. You can do a, a tag it with a rel telephone. It's a rel equals and then a quote, tele, uh, tel and then end quote. Um, and that's going to allow people on a mobile device to click and call you. I can't tell you how annoying it is when you're on somebody's website and they have the number there and you're on your phone and you just want to call them and you click it and it doesn't work and you have to copy and then paste it into your phone. It's just a hassle. Use that rel telephone on there and definitely scheme it up so Google knows what the phone number is for your, website, for your company. Same thing with the address, especially if you have multiple addresses. If you're a pizza place, if you're uh, any type of business with multiple brick and mortar locations, you want to schema up each address so Google knows that you have separate addresses and they don't think you just have one very convoluted address. This will be a good way to let them identify each individual business location. Now the site link search box is a pretty new feature. It allows you to uh, a user to search for your company like Zion, Zion.com and when your result shows up first, it's going to have a search this site feature. You've probably seen it if you've done a YouTube search. If you type YouTube into Google, uh, you'll see below YouTube there's a search and you can search YouTube there. Um, that takes a little bit of JSON schema in the head of the document. Uh, the head of the HTML is the part of the document that users don't see but search engines do. And it allows users to search your website quickly. So I definitely recommend using schema for that. You also want to schema, uh, have company schema so it easily identifies what your business is. This can add to the knowledge graph. That's the box next to the search results that describes what a company is. You want to have it on your navigation, so uh, your home, your about us, contact us, you can schema that up, as well as your breadcrumbs. Now this one's uh, particularly important because in the search engine results you've seen instead of putting the URL, they're now putting breadcrumbs. 
And the way they can do that is by schema markup data being on your breadcrumbs. If you're an e-commerce company, you want to use product schema and review schema to um, boost your results page. And you can see that in my previous example for Best Buy. Uh, this was product schema that they had here. And review schema, which is how they got those five stars. Now I'd like to talk about WordPress. WordPress is on about 28% of the websites on the internet right now. It's a great resource um, for development. It's very easy to use and update, and I would recommend it for anybody who's doing a, a website project. It can be used for small mom and pop shops to even, even enterprise businesses. So we've built them out for multi-million dollar companies, um, as well as like local services like plumbers. So I think it's uh, plausible for any website or company, as long as you're not an e-commerce. If you're e-commerce, I'd recommend Magento. But WordPress is definitely something you should look into if you're using a new website, because it's going to be easy for you to use. It's a lot like Word. You'll be able to understand it. Um, some things that you, you definitely want to put on your WordPress, uh, they have these things called plugins, uh, which allow you to edit parts of the website easily um, on the back end without having to have an expert do it. So I'd recommend the Yoast SEO plugin. It allows you to create custom metadata, so your titles and descriptions that we talked about earlier for each page. Uh, redirection. I'm going to talk about this a little bit more in a site migration. If you're building a new website, you're going to need to redirect your old URLs to your new URLs. And the way you do that is with a 301 redirect. This plugin redirection uh, allows you to do that quickly and easily. And then W3 Total Cache is a great plugin. Um, it speeds up your website. Uh, speed is definitely a ranking factor. Uh, and this tool here will, um, it gzips everything. So it, it compresses stuff for you. It minifies it so it compresses your code into as small of a file as possible. And you can even set up a content delivery network um, through this plugin. A content delivery network is something like Amazon. They have servers throughout the entire world. Instead of having somebody go to your single server, to find your website, uh, which may take some time if they're on the other side of the planet. Uh, they can go through Amazon, which has servers everywhere. Their servers are generally faster. Their speed is faster. So you're basically leveraging all of the technology they have for your website. So now those were all the on-site ranking factors. Now I want to talk about off-site ranking factors. Uh, and this is where things can get a little bit murky. Uh, especially with the updates from Google. And this is where you can get in trouble. So it's really important that you do these things right. Uh, Off-page uh, off or off-site ranking factors are signals from other websites that aid in the visibility of your site. So these are things like links, essentially. Um, so that's what I'm going to talk about here, link building. Now, this has gotten a bad name lately because uh, people have been doing it wrong. And then the, pigeon, uh, the Penguin update came, and uh, it really just... It really went after the people that have been doing it in an improper way and violating Google's guidelines. So it's very important. I would say that links to your website are the most important ranking factor. And it's not a quantity of links. Having one really, really good link is way better than having 100 bad links. So I would, I would encourage you to find out how you can get good links by doing uh, media interviews, being on the news. If you're on the news, ask them to link back to you. Um, if you have any partners, have them link back to you, things like these. Uh, don't get Russian links or links from India or have somebody in the Philippines get you 500 links. That's not going to be a good idea. Uh, and this works with PageRank, uh, what we talked about before, where if a, a site links to you, they have a specific page rank, and when they link to you, that rank is passed to you. Um, and that what, that's what makes you rank better. Uh, the Penguin updates target sites with bad links, so you definitely don't want to be bad links. If you're having a hard time figuring out what may be a bad link, a great tool is the Moz Bar. Uh, this is a tool called, a company called Moz. It's something you install in Chrome or Firefox. And they have a spam score for every page you go to if you have it turned on. And I wouldn't take a link from anybody with a spam score higher than four. Just throw them out. Don't even get it. Um, and they must be an editorial decision. Now, this is in Google's guidelines. An editorial decision means it's not a sponsored link, it's not a commented link. It's a link that the person who is writing the article put in there on purpose. Now there's two types of links. There's a nofollow links and then follow links. A nofollow link does not pass this page rank and a follow link does. 
nofollow links are used for advertising and sponsored links, um, as well as comment links and forum links, why, which is why I'd never recommend using comment or forum links. Uh, but follow links do pass the page rank. So if you are doing a link building strategy and you have a website in mind that you'd like a link from, make sure that it's a followed link. Usually people do this, but some tricky SEOs may no follow it. Um, and another thing, never, ever, 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 never, ever, 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 ever pay for links. That's where you're going to get in trouble. If you're trying to do link building and somebody says, oh, I'll build you a link for $100, just stop talking to them immediately. People who are selling links to their page will get caught, and you will get caught by the Penguin update if you're buying links. It is a bad idea. Do not pay for links. Another thing about um, off-site, and a lot of on-site, too, SEO is content marketing. So content marketing is creating content on your website, which is typically a blog or a resource center um, that is that has a lot of great information, like the What is SEO blog post I encourage all of you to read after this presentation. Uh, and it teaches people. It's a resource. It's something people can learn from. You want to create content that people are going to like, they're going to read, they're going to share on social media, and they're going to link to because it's so good they haven't found anything else on the web and they want to link to you. The way we use content marketing is we create a great piece of content, we Google the title of our content piece, and we reach out to the top 50 results and ask them to list us as a resource. That's how we use content marketing in our link building. It's been extremely successful. Uh, back to the organic traffic uh, graph I showed you on one of the first few slides. All of that increase has been done through content marketing and link building. This is the strategy I would propose to any business uh, to do content marketing or link building, creating resource pages and then going after similar pages and asking to be listed as a resource. Local SEO. This is something I'd like you to take some time out, pull your phones out, take a picture of this slide and tweet it out. Be sure to tag me on it at BenMFHolland and use the hashtag ZZSEO. Ben, how did you know I would have my phone handy? Oh, I, I just assume most people have their phones at their <laughs> You're clairvoyant. Yes, yes. Well, I, I encourage all of you to do this. Um, local SEO is very important for any brick and mortar business. You want people to find your business on the web so they can come to your business and buy things. And these are four things that you can do today. They're pretty simple. Um, and uh, it should really improve your visibility both on Google search and Google Maps search. So you want your address and contact information on every single page of your website. Put it in the footer. And when you put it in your footer, footer put schema microdata around it. If you have multiple locations, put all of your locations in the footer and schema them all up. And then if you have a single location or multiple locations, every single location needs to have a specific page on your website for that location. Do not bunch all of your locations onto one single page. Now this goes back to having a canonical page or a canonical term for every single page. Um, let's say you are a, a pizza place here in Phoenix and uh, you're uh, located, let's say Tempe is right next to Phoenix. So if you're a pizza place in Tempe and you have a Phoenix location, you want people to find your Tempe location when they're searching for pizza Tempe and your Phoenix location when they're searching pizza Phoenix. If they're on the same page, they're not going to get exactly what they want. It's not the best user uh, experience. So you want to have a page that targets that specific query. And also, I would definitely utilize local directories like Yelp and Google Maps, because oftentimes people will just go to Yelp and search for things. And if you're not on Yelp, you're not going to be found by a large segment of the population who are looking for your type of service that use Yelp as a reference. So I definitely recommend being on Yelp and Google Maps. A great tool you can use for that is called Moz Local. You upload a spreadsheet and it should push it out to all of these local directories for you with the correct information. But I would also recommend going into Yelp and Google Maps and editing them by hand for every single location, even if this takes a long time, so you can be sure that when people are on uh, their phones using Google Maps uh, or Yelp, and then Apple Maps also uses a lot of Yelp data, so that's why I really push Yelp. Um, they're getting the best experience and they're going to show up to your place. The worst thing that can happen is somebody coming to your location and they go to the wrong place or they go to a close location. That's, that's very frustrating and more than likely they're going to find a different business to spend their money at. 
Another thing people should be uh, really cognizant of uh, when doing anything SEO is if you're building a new website. A lot of companies and SEO agencies, SEO consultants are going to push for a new website because then they can really get in there, they know the code is correct, and they can optimize it properly. Number one rule for a new website is have it be responsive. Uh, responsive web design is an approach of web design aimed at crafting sites to provide optimal viewing and interaction experience. What does that mean? It means that when I'm on my phone and when I'm on my desktop, when I'm on my tablet or my laptop, the website looks good. You want the website to look good on any device no matter what. And res responsive design is the best answer for this. It's what Google recommends for web design and it has recommended for the past two years. So if you're building a new website, it must be responsive. Here's a good example of what responsive web design. I took this from W3Schools, which is a great resource uh, for HTML if you're trying to learn how to code or you just want to find out more information about HTML. Uh, W3Schools is a great resource for that. Uh, page speed. Page speed we talked about a little bit earlier, uh, but having a fast website is super important, especially for mobile results. Things that can slow down a website are large images. So something, I don't mean uh, size, I mean file size. So anything over, you know, 50 kilobytes or 100 kilobytes uh, is too big. You can compress it using Photoshop or other photo editing um, software you want to save for web. Um, and make sure that it's, I like all my pictures under 25K. I think that's a good rule of thumb. Uh, having a slow server, we talked about this with a CDN. If you use a content delivery network or CDN, you're not going to have to worry about having a slow server. Uh, a lot of people use GoDaddy. I have experience with GoDaddy. A lot of websites are on a server for GoDaddy. It can really bog it down. I would definitely recommend if your page is slow to use a CDN. Too many requests to the server. So uh, having a lot of JavaScript on your website, a lot of images, those all send, uh, reach out to the server and pull something down. It's called a request. Um, if you have uh, a lot of plugins on your website, if you have a lot of JavaScript reaching out to the server, it's going to slow you down, and that goes hand in hand with bad code. Uh, having bad code can really slow down your website, so you want to make sure you have good, clean code. If you're looking at a template for your website, make sure you read the reviews and look at how well the code is done. Um, a good resource for you is this developers.google. It's the page speed insight tool. It's a link here at the bottom, um, and that'll tell you how uh, well Google ranks your page speed. Uh, it's straight from the horse's mouth. We use it on every website we look at or create. Uh, you want to be I'd say 65 or higher for mobile and 85 or higher for desktop. It's really hard to get a green score, uh, so don't be upset if you can't get into the greens. Anything yellow, I'd say, is good. Uh, next, I want to talk about something that I do a lot here, and that's migration. Uh, we create a lot of very high-end websites here at Zion and Zion. It's one of the things we do best. That's web design. Uh, and my role in that is to make sure that when you get a new website, your rankings don't drop. Because a big, big problem with a new website is uh, the URL structure changes. Google doesn't know where your pages are. All of the pages in the Google index go to a 404 page or a not found page. Uh, so Google drops your rankings. You don't get any organic traffic. Uh, it's a big issue. Uh, a new website can take your visibility out of the search engine completely. So it has to be done properly. So you want to redirect every URL from the old site to a similar page on the new site and update the sitemap. It's not that difficult to do properly. It is very time consuming to create the redirects, but it is a must. And if you're building a new website and your agency or a consultant is not doing a migration, uh, you have to have them do this. Now here's some information on how to hire an SEO. Um, a lot of times people just don't know what to look for. Uh, people are going to talk over their heads. They're going to use a lot of jargon. So I really wanted to make it easy for you to help identify what's good, what's bad, and what you need to look for when hiring somebody to help you with your search engine optimization. Uh, some run words. Uh, this happens to me a lot. I'm a small business owner. I'll get a call from somebody. Usually they have some sort of accent. And they're asking me if I'd like to rank number one uh, for a specific term that my website is targeting. Um, so a lot of these people are going to use terms like, I guarantee you to make it to the first page. You'll have immediate results. Things like these are not feasible. Any good SEO strategy is going to take 6 to 12 months to work. And they're not going to guarantee anything because Google is constantly changing. If somebody gives you a guarantee, I would run. If they say your results are going to be immediate, run. If they're going to buy links, if they're going to do article marketing, 
if you're going to do comment marketing or forum links, run. If you're a personal blog network, that is a guaranteed way to get hit with the Panda update. Do not use them if they're going to use a personal blog network. And if they don't report to you, uh, one of our clients came in, they say they haven't gotten a report in seven years from the SEO company. They have no idea what they've been doing. If there's no reporting, it's a no-go. So if you could take a minute, pull your phones out and tweet this. I think this is probably the most important slide in the entire slide deck here. If you hear these, just move on because this is something that raises red flags. All right, keep your phones out because the next slide also has, I'd like you to tweet out. And that's the last one. And I thank you for uh, engaging with us and uh, tweeting these out. So I hope everybody in your community uh, can learn from this experience. So good words. Words you want to hear. So now this is something else you'd want to tweet out using the hashtag ZZSEO. Uh, this is stuff you want to hear. If you come calling Zion and Zion and you want us to do SEO for you or make you a new website, uh, these are things we're going to talk about. And this is what you want to hear from anybody. Search is dynamic. And what I mean by this is that if I do a search here on my phone and I do a search sitting in the same spot on my computer or if my colleague does the search, it's going to be different. The results will be different. There is no page that is going to be number one for the same search everywhere for everybody. It's dynamic. Every search has the result populated that second and that instant. If you're logged into Google, it's different than if you're logged out. If you're on a phone, it's different. If you're on an Android phone, or an Apple phone, your result could be different. So search is dynamic. So you really don't want to focus on being in that top spot. You want to focus on the traffic you're getting from organic search. It's not about rankings. It's about traffic. And it's because search is dynamic. You want to hear people talking about schema. I talked about schema in depthly here. It's very important. It is the wave of the future. And if you don't use it, you will be left behind. If you're talking to an SEO who does not know about schema, they probably haven't read any of the updates in the past four or five years. Same thing with canonical. This is uh, not as new as schema, but having a canonical URL and a canonical term for each page is extremely important. You want people to do SEO audits. The first step in any client we get is I take four or five hours and I'll do an SEO audit. I'll look at every aspect of their on-site and off-site, and I will report back to them. Uh, you also want to hear them coming up with an SEO strategy and a content strategy, because content and SEO go hand in hand. And something I just spoke about earlier uh, that I really, really want to harp on here is thinking about organic traffic and not rankings. What matters is the people that come to your site through the search engine and how they convert. It doesn't matter where you rank. Yes, ranking higher will get you more traffic, but if you're focusing on rankings, you're going to get tunnel vision for a specific term or group of terms, and you're not going to understand that long tail terms, other terms, non-related terms, are going to drive conversions to your website. So you should be focusing on that graph that I showed you on the first page. Think about your organic traffic. You want it to go up. It may not go up every single month, but you want to see a consistent growth in that. And that's how you should gauge any SEO campaign. Not by rankings, but by organic traffic. The cost. And this is going to be the last topic I cover, so thank you for bearing with me. Um, the cost of SEO. Uh, SEO can be expensive, especially link building. Good link building takes a very long time and has very little results. Usually there's about a 2% success rate with link building. So uh, it takes about four or five hours for a good SEO to get a single link. So link building takes time, but it's an absolute necessity if you really want to have a good SEO campaign. The results should take about six to 12 months, months to work and uh, see, and then they'll be consistent after that. It's not going to just stop after 12 months you're going to see that organic traffic continue to increase. A good campaign will take at a minimum 50 hours of work. It's not easy. It's not simple. It takes a lot of time to understand what's going on with your site, what terms you should be targeting, and optimizing it for that. And a good SEO is going to be expensive. If somebody's charging you $25 to do SEO, he's probably not worth, he's not worth any money. A, a good SEO is going to cost you over $100 an hour, even if it's a consultant or an agency. So you're going to have to invest if you're having other people do it, but you want other people to do it so you know it's done right. Uh, but I would say any SEO campaign is going to take around $5,000 uh, to do well at a minimum. Um, well, that's all I have for you. I want to thank you for taking time out of your day to listen to me. I want to thank Ring Partner for helping me put on this webinar uh, and reaching out to me and letting this happen. Um, 
just to please move forward and check out our What is SEO uh, blog post. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out at, uh, for me on Twitter at Ben M. F. Holland. And I'm free to uh, answer any questions you guys have. i got about 15 minutes for questions. So I'll go ahead and um, let Henry uh, send those over to me. Awesome. Thanks, man. That was an amazing presentation. I don't think anybody can say that uh, we're we're not better educated on on SEO now. So thank you so much. Um, ben, I wanted to sort of ask you. Uh, I have a question myself uh, before we get going here. You've been in the industry for about eight years now, and I I loved you know learning about all the different updates Google has. You know, you've been in the in the industry a long time. Do you sort of see a trend? Like, what would you say is sort of the next? hot topic coming up for, for SEO? Is it, you know, bigger push to, to mobile, or what would you say? Yeah, I think uh, mobile first. Uh, Google just came out with a new update to Maps. I don't know if you guys have noticed it, but it's exactly like their Google Maps app. They are thinking mobile first. They have been thinking mobile first uh, for years now, and they're, they're really pushing for it. And another thing, a schema is going to be big, because it's how you can talk to the search engines and give them what they need to give you better results. And voice search. Um, the Hummingbird update was just the beginning of voice search. Uh, people are no longer going to write and read search results. They're going to say and hear them. They're going to take their phone, say, OK, Google, where is the, local, where is the closest pizza location? And then Google will say, uh, Domino's is just around the corner six minutes away. Would you like directions? Um, so being able to show up in those Google answer boxes is what's going to allow you to be visible in voice search. So voice search is the future. I think that things like Amazon's Echo, Siri, and OK Google are going to eliminate websites entirely, like Google uh, search engines, where you're just going to hear results. So I would definitely push wow. to get in those answer boxes uh, and be forward thinking about mobile. That's very cool, Ben. That's really exciting to hear. Um, we've got kind of a couple questions that kind of ask the same thing. Um, how do websites not get hit, uh, sort of like punished for duplicate content? For example, if a site sort of maps links to like a hundred or a thousand different domains and they all look the same, minus like a, a slight, a slight, uh, you know, adjustment here or there. I mean, that's not. That's generally going to be punished, right? They don't like that. But I mean, some sites get yeah. away with it. Or what? What do you think there? I think, um, so the rule of thumb is you don't want more than 20% duplicate content on any page on your website. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the strategy before was to create a lot of pages and then change the city name out so you could rank for that city with that specific service. Now, that's a big no-no because -no you're going to have a lot of duplicate content. The main issue with duplicate content is content on your site and other sites. Uh, if you have the content first, you're going to rank. If the other site had it after you, they won't rank. Um, so that's the big thing with uh, the the Panda update and duplicate content. And now there's the Panda update has two things that I wanted to talk about. There's manual actions and then there's algorithmic actions. So a manual action is they're going to send you an email and there's going to be a message in your uh, Google Search Console, formerly called Google Webmaster Tools, and they're going to say, hey, you have a manual action. It's on this page or your entire site, and this is what we're talking about. An algorithmic one is a lot harder to find. It's where uh, they don't think you have to have a manual action. But they're going to lower your rankings, and you're going to see a dip in your organic traffic because they think, you know, you're really close. You're not really playing by the rules. You have a lot of duplicate content, so we're not going to rank you as well. And uh, those can be found using different tools, uh, something like Barracuda or Fruition, or anytime you see a big drop in your organic traffic where it's like a plateau and it falls off of a cliff, that's a, a good uh, idea that you have uh, some sort of algorithmic penalty. Okay. Cool. Uh, we, we, these questions are great, guys. Keep them coming. Uh, so we have one question that asks this. Um, so newer age sites have like image sliders above the fold, and they usually are quite large. Uh, what is the best way to optimize these larger images, and is image quality still a concern? Uh, they found that compressing the slider images below 500 kilobytes makes the quality drop. Do you have any, any insight there, Ben? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think quality is extremely important. You want to have a good user experience, especially with retina displays like um, iMacs, iPhones, pretty much anything Apple has is retina. So they have much denser pixels, so you want those high quality images. Um, I would recommend uh, using Photoshop and the Save uh, for Web Devices tool. You can usually get those big slider images under 100K if you're using that Save for Web Devices. You can make it so that tool, if you're not familiar with it, it brings up the original, let's say it's 500 kilobytes, and it brings up, uh, next to it, it brings up what you want to save it as. And then there's a slider bar where you can say, what percentage of quality do you want of the original? I usually go around 30%. That gets me into the under 100 kilobytes without any noticeable 
uh, degradation of the image. Um, sliders do take a long time to load. Uh, if you have a lot of their JavaScript heavy, it might affect your page rank score. I'm not personally a big fan of sliders. I know that they're very beneficial for some uh, niches and verticals and you want them there. Let's say um, you're like a realtor, you're going to want to have a lot of pictures and it makes sense. I prefer a static image uh, to a slider, but if you do need it, make sure you have a nice clean slider, a good clean code, not a lot of JavaScript requests to the server, and your images are of high quality but as small file size as possible. And if, you, if you're stuck doing 500 kilobytes of picture, just have a couple of them. Don't have a whole lot. Right. That's great. Thanks very much, Ben. Uh, the questions, we got a couple more. Uh, one question, Ben, it says here, uh, he has several websites on his own cloud server, which has the same IP address. Uh, does having these sites on the same server linking content to each other, or linking to each other, beg your pardon, uh, does that get punished by Google? It depends, yeah. Okay. So um, if they find, they're called IP blocks or uh, C blocks, that's IPs are broken into four dotted segments. Usually an identifier of somebody being on the same IP block is that third segment. So Google looks for that uh, more than, like if the IP is an exact match, it'll see that, but it looks for those C blocks. So that's the most important uh, part of the IP you want to differentiate, that third segment. Right. Um, I think that if you're doing everything uh, on the up and up, if you're linking to these sites for good reasoning and it's not a, a, a link farm, uh, you should be all right. Uh, it's very common to have multiple websites on there. I have a few websites. I go through GoDaddy. They're all on the same GoDaddy server. They all have the same IP address. That's fine. But when you start linking to them and you're doing like a lot of really uh, anchor text rich links and you're really trying to bend the rules, I would be super cautious about that because you're already raising the red flag for having a common IP. Mm -hmm. If everything's on the up and up, you should be fine. Cool. All right, uh, so we're going to do about five more minutes of questions, guys. So if you have any uh, others, try and get them in because we're on a first-come, first-serve basis. Uh, ben, uh, this gentleman has a question about schema. Uh, is there an easier way to add schema to your site if you're using uh, WP CMS without digging into the PHP files, or is this really the only way? Yeah, um, I know that there are plugins for schema. Mm -hmm. uh, here we have a great team of developers, so we don't need to utilize these plugins because adding plugins to WordPress or modules to Drupal or Joomla or Magento, those, uh, the plugins do, they make it a lot easier for you, but they add to the JavaScript files on your website and they add to the code to your website, so they can slow you down, especially if they're not coded properly. Um, so whenever you're choosing a plugin, I'd be very uh, cognizant of how much slower it makes your site. So what I like to do is run the Google PageSpeed Insights test before I add the plugin. I add the plugin and run it and see what the difference is. If it's nominal, run with it. If it isn't, uh, I wouldn't use the plugin. Um, schema is pretty easy to implement. There are schema generators out there. I know Google has one and there's others that you can copy and paste the code in. And that might be the route you want to go to. Uh, but if you can find a plugin that's pretty clean and does the job you need, by all means, go for it. I know there's a ton of them out there. But we here, I do it by hand. Um, generally, you need to get in, if it's WordPress, you need to get into the PHP of the, the code. So you, you have to know a little bit of PHP or get a developer to aid you with it. Uh, but there are tools and resources out there to make it easy for you, even if you don't have any type of development background. Okay, very cool. Okay, guys, uh, we got a lot more questions and not a ton of time, so I'm trying to uh, try to pick uh, the best ones for the for the group. Um, so, Ben, this question is: uh, How can an affiliate have many physical addresses for Google Maps or local search engine optimization? Um, can you clarify an affiliate? Are you meaning like a single business with multiple locations? Um, yeah, I'm not sure uh, exactly the nature of the question um, in terms of. Uh, maybe like physical addresses themselves, um, but I mean, yeah, as an affiliate as an individual. Okay, so uh, we have a client, it's a pizza company here in uh, Phoenix, and um, we optimize, now they don't play by the rules, they have all their locations on one page, um, but we optimize for schema for them because you can identify each business as a local business, mm -hmm. um, and then you can end that section. So schema goes hand in hand with your code, so if you have a specific section for that location, it's like a div or something, uh, that schema is going to close at the end of the div, and then you make a new div for another local business, and it'll just be a different location. So that's how they can identify the different locations. I hope that answered your question. Cool. Um, I'm not quite sure if I, if I understood it properly. 
Okay. Um, another question here, uh, Ben, we've got, uh, does, uh, do you know if programming language used on the server has any effect over SEO? Apparently there's a myth that Python-based websites rank faster than PHP-based. Uh, I haven't heard that. Um, you know, PHP, ASPX, uh, Ruby on Rails, Ajax, uh, all of these are great ways to make websites. Mm -hmm. You just want to follow SEO best practices. If you're worried about getting ranked fast, Submit your sitemap using Google Search Console and Bing Webmaster Tools. That's going to be the fastest way for you to get indexed and going. You can have them crawl it, and then you can submit it to index, and it'll get in there in a matter of minutes okay. if you're worried about deep indexation. Okay, great. Uh, let's do two more question, guys, and then we're going we're gonna to let Ben go. Um, ben, this guy, uh, gentleman, rather, asks, how concerned should I be with aggregate sites that collect addresses when it comes to his local SEO efforts? Uh, they found that using tools like Moz, uh, that some of their clients' addresses are incorrect on many of the aggregate sites. Yeah, yeah, so um, Moz Local, um, WhiteSpark, uh, Yext, there's a ton of tools out there that do this. Uh, I like Moz Local because it's relatively affordable. It's $84 a year for a location. Um, and you upload, so I'll just run you through the quick process because I'm sure not everybody on the webinar is familiar with what this person is talking about. So the problem is you have like Yelp, YP, uh, Google Maps, they're all out there. People are finding your business, but they don't have the same information. And it's really important that you have uniform information across all of these platforms for uh, SEO benefits. So Moz Local and other tools like this take this information and they push it out to the big wigs, the big people that disperse it out, because it's really like three sites like Axiom and Google and a couple others that all the people are pulling the data from. So make sure they have the right information so the other ones do. So Moz Local will push this feed to them. It takes three to six months for it to be complete, mm -hmm. but it should have uniformity. And if it isn't uniform, they're going to say there's an inconsistency. It's going to identify that and flag it for you. So then you can create a, a login and go in there and edit it by hand. And that's how we do local SEO here. Um, that's how I believe most people do do it. It's the way I found is quickest, most efficient, and has the best results. Fantastic. All right, Ben, uh, one more question, and then I'll let you go. Um, ben, are you seeing any techniques to rank a non-YouTube video on a mobile-friendly web version? Uh, non-YouTube video. Yeah, so I like using Vimeo for all of my um, video hosting on websites because I think the player is a lot cleaner. Mm -hmm. It's also a free service, and they have pretty basic analytics. So um, I wrote an entire blog post on our website, How to Rank Better Than YouTube. Uh, so you'll have your same video on your site and on uh, YouTube. So I, I encourage you to look for that on our website. You can use the search in the blog and just type in YouTube and you'll, you should find it. Uh, but the key is to transcribe your video um, because Google can't see or hear your video. They need to read the words in it. So you need to transcribe it and have that transcription on the page. I would also have supplemental content. Uh, so the big the whole thing about ranking better than YouTube is having a better page than YouTube. So just have more content on there than YouTube does. Make sure it's transcribed because they transcribe it. And definitely schema up the video because that's going to help it. Um, and that's how you do it. And I would, I would push everybody to put videos on Vimeo and YouTube and then host it on their site with Vimeo because it's a cleaner player. But also have it available on YouTube because it is the second largest search engine. Excellent. Excellent. All right. Well, that brings us to the end, I think, of our webinar. Uh, I want to thank all our attendees uh, for joining. Thank you so much. And obviously, a huge thanks to Ben uh, for giving us that great presentation. Uh, everybody, definitely check out uh, zionandzion.com. Uh, I've been looking at the website a little bit here, and it just looks incredible. Really good resources there with the blog that Ben mentioned. And uh, please reach out to him if you have any other questions. And just to reiterate, uh, this webinar was recorded. It will be available on our YouTube channel. That's YouTube youtube.com slash ring partner it'll be available on our uh, getting started uh, website as well you can follow us on twitter at ringpartner.com and find us on facebook please give us a call or an email if you have any questions or feedback about this webinar uh, we've gotten excellent feedback so far on our ring partner university session so if you have an idea for a topic that you'd like to you know like us to get an expert on uh, let me know i know what you're all going to say we need ben back uh, but ben is very busy so we can't get him every week but hopefully uh, ben if you uh, if you're up for it, we'll have you again and back in a couple months and talk about uh, some other great service Zion and Zion has for us. All right. Well, thank you for having me. And I encourage everybody to come to our website and follow me on Twitter at Ben M. F. Holland. Awesome. All right, guys. Thanks again. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.